Today, I'm sitting down with B. Dave Walters. He's the creative director for Demiplane RPG. He's the lead designer of Motherlands RPG, and he is the DM for Dungeons & Dragons, The Black Dice Society. We discuss his journey through TTRPG development, what he'd like to see changed, and what he has changed in the past, as well as discussing creating horror in Dungeons and Dragons, how difficult it can be, and how to make it work in your D&D games. Sit back and relax. You're listening to Roll for Insight. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Roll for Insight, Mr. B. Dave Walters. Thank you so much for coming onto the show. It's a B. Dave. <laughs> yeah, that's the dozens and dozens of my fans screaming outside. <laughs> hey, I mean, there's definitely people. You run Black Dice Society, man. That, that stuff is awesome. Oh, thank you. You know, two different people independently told me today of like other people telling them about the Black Dice Society and like, you should really be watching this show. And they're like, yeah, and I was like, the word is spreading. The yeah. word is spreading. Good. It's good stuff, dude. But cool. yeah, so we have a tradition on this show. We have a traditional question. First question of the day, something I always ask, Mr. Walters, what is your D&D pet peeve? It's not something that will break up a friendship or a group, but it's just a small little thing that makes you go, Ugh, why'd you do that? Somebody that fourth edition is their favorite edition. That's the first time we've had an edition um, mentioned on the show. Damn. Uh, I mean, again, we can still be friends. Uh, I'm not here to kink shame anybody, but on the inside, I'm judging you. Yep. What's uh? What are your what are your main issues with fourth edition? It wasn't D and D, and and I believe the 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 thesis is borne out by the fact that fifth edition went back to the game that we all knew and loved, and has been gargantuanly excess, uh, successful. Fourth edition was they tried to make Dungeons and Dragons into an MMO, and it didn't work. Um, yeah, yeah. Although I, I, I will say, if Wizards of the Coast had just put out a different game, if it was fourth edition verbatim, but had been named something else, it probably would have sold well and everybody would have been happy and the world would have kept turning. So it's, uh, it, it is not that it is innately bad. It was just such a sharp deviation from the thing we all showed up to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have been working in the creative space of creating tabletop role-playing games, working in Dungeons & Dragons. You are working with the guys at Wizards of the Coast. You're running their Black Dice Society game on the official D&D YouTube channel. So you've been around the space for a while. And I am curious, like, yeah. how did you break into it uh, and start working with these games? I mean, so many people play and so many people create content for it, but not a lot of people get the opportunity to work on creating the actual products that get out into the hands of the consumers and the DMs and players alike use to play the game. Believe it or not, the way I got in was when Tomb of Annihilation came out, uh, I was very vocally critical of their portrayal of Cholt. Cholt is the non-specifically Africa of of Faerun. It's debatable. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of Africa, Southeast Asia ish. You know, places with jungles. But you know, the people of color are in Cholt, and it was just bad. It was just very tone deaf, and and I was very public about that. And to Watsi's eternal credit in general and Greg Tito's credit in particular, they were like, you're right. Because no, the number one thing I said was I'm like, it's clear to me no people of color were involved in this process. You know, that none of this is malicious. I, I don't, uh, I didn't call it racist. I was like, it's just tone deaf. Like you guys didn't think this through. Uh, because I'm like, this is a fantasy setting. All the black people could have lived on the moon. Like you could have done anything. In the original Tomb of Annihilation or the original Chult was mad racist out of the 80s. Uh, you know, bones through the nose, cannibals, pygmies, all of that, uh, which obviously they cleaned all that stuff up, but it was just kind of then sort of a bland post-colonial uh, thing where it still was just sort of picking up the pieces after the occupiers left. And I'm like, that sucks. And again, to their eternal credit, they were like, you're right. That was an oversight on our part. And they started talking to people like me and other creators like Tanya DePass and Gabe James and just making a concerted effort to bring in other opinions and perspectives and have other people at the table. And I think it has shown 
in the product. And, and obviously in, in the ensuing years, D and D just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and has more and more and more success. And a lot of that is just the cultural wave we're writing, of course. But I think the fact that the products appeal to a broader base or at least are not actively alienating any basis of people has contributed a lot to that growth. So you actually think, because a lot of people think that what happened was D&D grew and more diverse people started coming into the game and then they changed it. You think that the audience grew because they made the change instead? It's both. Um, because I think that's a common misconception in that, you know, women and people of color have been playing these games since their infancy. You know, I, I point out to people, cyberpunk was created by a black man, Mike Pondsmith. You know, and it, it is not that we were not participating in these spaces. But it's we were almost participating in these spaces in spite of, you know, the stereotype of the neck bearded comic book guy uh, is not inaccurate. I know those dudes. I've known lots of those dudes. But people like me were always there. And then there's a whole second tier of people who truly wanted to play and didn't know how. I can tell you how many people were like, I knew people were playing D&D, &D, but nobody invited me. I didn't know how to get into it. Or, you know, it wasn't for girls or it wasn't for athletic kids or it wasn't for these people or that people. And the more you reduce those walls and people start to understand that, you know, these games are for all people, then I, I think that that in, that in tandem. So it, it is it is both of those things, you know, as, as the chain has gone national. But also the restaurants are easier to get into and the lines are shorter. Both things are happening. Yeah, it's very refreshing to hear someone articulate that point of view because it's so often that you hear like, oh, D&D has gone woke, which is such a meaningless word now because of, of the people who are coming in. And it's just so refreshing to finally hear someone say, no, I mean, the reason people are coming in is, or you know, half of it is because they have changed their ways and they have really cultivated this new community you know it's funny you say what will make me look down at people and using you know woke as a, as a as a negative thing or things being too woke is one of those things you know because it's like how it, it costs you nothing to respect another person in their point of view you may not agree with them but to treat a human like a human doesn't cost you anything at all and you know in this pastime you can do whatever you want at your table of course you can if you want to tell some bullshit story of elven winches in metal bikinis and the barbarian orcs that live in the mountains, I mean, you could do that. Just don't expect me to play or if you put it on, anybody to watch, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, yeah. Can you uh, tell us a couple of things that, I mean... Obviously, this isn't just one person. It's a huge movement. Tons of new people are coming into the industry and making some real changes. Can you uh, articulate some of the most positive things that you've seen or even that you've contributed to? Uh, again, just this push to appeal to everybody and just make sure people know that, that there's a seat at the table for everyone, you know, because as a pastime, TTRPGs in general and D&D in particular can be... A, a, a fairly high wall to scale. If you don't have someone to take you by the hand and be like, well, here's a player's handbook. This is actually all you need to play the game. You know, the, the, well, but what if I'm the dungeon master? Do I have to have the dungeon master's guide? Well, I mean, you kind of can, but no, you don't have to. You know what I mean? Like to really be like, this is a 20 sided die. Let me explain to you what this does. You know, like it, we, those things seem self-evident now but i think people lose track of the fact that there was a time that every single one of us had no concept of what that was so just lowering those barriers of entry to the hobby and to the pastime because that's just a net good and i think this is what the gatekeepers miss i mean don't get me wrong they're wrong about a lot of things yep um but the number one thing they miss when people rant about something becoming too commercial or something like that, games are a for-profit enterprise. This is not the March of Dimes. So if WotC does well, that's good. It means they will make more things. Any company that you like, if they're making more revenue, they'll make more stuff. And that's a positive. So that's why I always tell people, vote with your wallet. If, if somebody is doing something, a creator, a company, a Kickstarter, crowdfunding, anything, is doing something that is even moving in the direction that you want to see something go, support it because you will get more of that. If they're going in a direction that you don't want and doing things that you don't want to see, then don't. I didn't buy any of the fourth edition books. 
Um, because I was like, I don't want to send a false positive here. I remember a specific story that is like, you know, what now seems in times long past, uh, when Black Panther first came out, there was a push in some circles that you boycott Black Panther and not see it because it wasn't actually filmed in Africa, that it wasn't black enough and therefore don't go see it. And I was like, no, 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 no. Because that is not the message that Marvel and Disney and Hollywood will take from this, that we should have made it blacker. They will take from this that there's no market for this. No one cares and you won't get any more of it. Obviously, Black Panther came out, was amazing, smash success, and this became a non-thing. Quite, but a, bit, I hear quite a bit of like money that. in Disney's pocket after yeah. that movie came out. Ma- made a couple of dollars, made a couple of dollars. A little yeah. bit, but yeah. I hear that kind of thing all the time. And I think what, what I have a unique perspective in that my background is business and my background is marketing. And I bleed very blue. I don't think that's any, any, uh, any surprise. But I definitely see there's times that there are these overly idealistic bullshit purity tests that people try and put on individuals a lot and on brands where you're like, that what you're saying is not a thing. That was in here. Here's a number of reasons why the thing you're saying is not a thing, you know, Um, and you got to pick your battles and understand that, you know, the wheel of justice turns slow, but it is inevitable. You take something like D&D with 50 plus years of lore, it takes time to turn that ship. But the ship is turning, you know, that's I, I don't because if a thing changes too radically, whatever that thing is, if it changes too radically overnight, you risk alienating a lot of your fan base, i.e. fourth edition versus incrementally introducing these changes in a way that is palatable, then everybody's happy. Absolutely. So this has been a running theme on the show with me talking to some players who have been playing for a bit, but Recently, we've been talking about things that we'd like to see changed in 5th edition. Now, it could be anything. Like, what do you think you would want to change in 5th edition if you had complete power over Dungeons and & Dragons and Wizards, over what you could put or take out of the books? Could be a rule, could be a gameplay thing, could be lore, whatever. What would you change? Passive skill checks. I hate the idea that you can be worse at something by trying. Mm, interesting. What would you change it to? I would either make the mechanic that the lowest you can possibly get on the roll is your passive. So it's like the ceiling, like a lot of people home rule it that way or the floor rather, uh, in that, you know, if you got a a 15 in search, then you can, uh, you know, the lowest you can ever get on the skills of 15. The problem is it is pretty easy to get a passive insight or passive perception north of 20 or upwards of 30. And then it puts the DM in a spot where every time you walk into a room, they just have to reveal everything. And then that actually gets really boring. Like you walk into a room and there's a trap door and that guy's hiding a knife. You know, you're like, huh? You know, <laughs> like, yeah, I hate that. Traditionally, I really hated the rules for attack of opportunities. They're better now than they used to be, but I still don't like it. Those rules are clearly written by someone who's never been in a fight. Just the fact that you get close to someone means they automatically hit you, or that if you try and move away from them, they automatically hit you. That is not how combat works at all. And so that always bothered me. The fifth edition is is more palatable. But yeah, passive passive skill checks more than anything. And I myself always play with a house rule that a one always fails and a 20 always succeeds, even on skill checks, because you were never so hopelessly outmatched that you can't pull a Hail Mary. You were never so good that failure is impossible. Hmm, interesting. I really like that rule where, with the with the the floor requirement for a, for a check. I, I like that a lot because often there'll be times where I, I'm thinking to myself, like, okay, I'll have this person roll the check because... Like, I want there to be some chance of failure, but I want them to succeed. And even though, like, the check is them trying to open a door, a really strong paladin trying to open the door, they fail. That just feels really bad, right? Yep, absolutely. And and it can and it can slow things down. And that's one of the hardest things about DMing, too, is feeding enough clues or feeding enough opportunities to have your characters ultimately triumph with something. And I see this most, most comes up with puzzles. Because the thing about puzzles is, you know, you're either a puzzle person or you aren't. And a lot of times when you're exposed to something, you're going to get it or you won't. Like in the before times, before the dark times and the coming of the apocalypse, I used to do a lot of escape rooms. 
And my friends and I would just descend on these rooms like a swarm of killer bees. And everybody picks a thing and you spend about two minutes. And if you don't get it, you have to switch off to somebody else. It's like because your brain will lock up on what you think it is and you're just not going anywhere. And if you have something that is pivotal to the game and people just aren't getting it, you need some mechanism to get that across. I just let me not say anything else because, uh, well, no, you say this is going up next week. So I can vague book about this. Uh, I recently played in a game that was a trap, and apparently the whole thing was a trap. It was a very long con. None of us knew that, and we ended up just spinning our wheels for like 90 minutes. And it was very frustrating and irritating because you're like, the hell am I supposed to do? And that's not the feeling you want. You want mystery, but not irritation. Uh, I I think my friend uh, Erin M. Evans, what does she call it? It's the, the difference between a tease and a trick, you know? You know, you know, you don't ever want to feel tricked. So you have been running Black Dice Society for a while now. You're running for a pretty large group. It's a horror-oriented game. It takes place in Ravenloft, the infamously scary D&D environment. Mists, vampires, all the scary stuff. So... Mm-hmm. A lot of DMs struggle with getting their players invested in the horror because D&D, sometimes it can devolve into dick jokes and puns. But yep. if you want the horror, how do you facilitate that environment? You, as a couple of things. The first and foremost, you have to be very clear and upfront with the players with that that's the game you're playing. This is always important that you have to make sure that the DM and the players are playing the same game and also that all the players at the table are playing the same game because that is not always the case. If one person wants high drama in character moments and dialogue and another person only wants to be a murder hobo, you got to balance. I mean, one, you're probably in for a tough time, but two, you as the DM knows you have to give the talky person a chance to talk and the fighty person a chance to fight and ideally the sneaky person a chance to sneak and all that stuff. Um... When we were doing the Black Dice Society, I knew those were the six people I wanted. They were all my they were my top six choices, and they all said yes. And one of the things that I very sharply underlined to them repeatedly is this will not be that that's what she said game. Because uh, the key element of horror is tension. Humor exists to diffuse tension. That's what humor is for. Uh, that's why people have deflective humor. That's why a lot of times when people get stressed out and stuff, they'll tell jokes because it cuts the tension in a room. It literally releases chemicals in your brain that make you relax, which is death to hit horror. I will say, and I've told this story before, I had one person, and I won't tell you which one it was, came to me and was like, I cannot be serious for three hours. I can't do it. Like, I, I cannot do it. And... I was like, well, but we still can't be having like dad jokes and dick jokes. So what we sorted out is we put together their character was going to be the tassel hot barefoot, the eternal optimist that no matter how terrible and bleak things got in Ravenloft, this one person was always going to look on the bright side. You know what I was like? Absolutely. I can work. I can work with that. I can work with that. And we get around to the first game, first session. We're introducing the characters. They all come out. And they opened their mouth, and what came out of their mouth was not that character. And I was like, well, all right, we're doing this then. You know, which don't get me wrong. I've had that happen. I've had that happen lots of times where you're like, this is who this person is. And then you start talking, and you're like, now they're this other person because here we are. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge that, that, that I have had with this, or the, something I've tried to be cognizant of, you know, I've run a lot of Vampire. I've run about 600 sessions of, of V5. I used to run about 35, 40 games a month at the height of my Patreon. I've run more V5 than anyone else alive. So I know that game. And that is horror horror. That's what Vampire is. is a storytelling game of personal horror. D&D, even though it is horror, it's horror Dungeons & Dragons. So with that, there's certain elements that have to exist to still let the game be what it is. Things like... Combat, for instance, uh, you know, you 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 still got to be able to throw a fireball. Sometimes you can't get so far away from that and still have it be this thing. You know, 
skill checks, stuff like that. You know, D and D is a crunchier system than some. You know what I mean? So you still need to feel like D and D while feeling like scary D and D. But you know, the besides having done that initial check in to let everybody know this is going to be a scary story, there's actually times where careful injection of humor is actually good because it, that human beings cannot maintain a high emotional state for long periods of time. Like we literally can't do it. You're bra- Oh, yeah. We got we, we got similar similar pints there. Oh, I got um, I got Game of Thrones houses on mine. Oh, this is Stormcrow Tavern on mine. Oh, Sorry, I'm gonna give you. Yeah. I'm gonna give. I'm gonna give you that whole thing over again. Sorry, because I, I I got. No, no, I, we'll I, we'll keep it. In. We'll keep it. Then oh. we gotta give a shout out to Stormcrow Tavern right now. Right? Shout out to Stormcrow Tavern. Yeah, if you watch Black Dice Society, you've seen my stein. Uh, yeah, you cannot stay in a heightened emotional state for for long periods of time. No one can do it. You you can't cry nonstop for an hour. You can't laugh nonstop for an hour. You can't be terrified or overjoyed that long. Your central nervous system literally will not let you do it. We got somewhere between 20 to 35 minutes in which you can maintain a peak emotional state before your central nervous system gives out. So the way to deal with that is you wave the emotions up and down over the course of the story. And you'll see if you think of your favorite movie, especially if it's a comedy or horror movie, especially, you'll see this where it seems like things are getting better. You know, there actually might be some lighthearted moments before things plummet into something terrible. Comedies usually are the opposite. Oh, no, they lost the girl. This is terrible. The car broke down. They're broken alone. Oh, something happens. Her, her, her credits. So, you know, you can carefully insert moments that can still be light moments in a dark story. Dare I say you have to. Um, in order to uh, keep the the players engaged and just to whiplash them. Yeah, I was watching a great video from Taking 20 about handling the peanut gallery players, like the ones that always have to do the quip. And he even admits, like, it's really, really hard to do sometimes, like managing stuff in the moment. Like, you can have a brilliant session zero, but sometimes people really need to diffuse with humor. And like you said, however, sometimes, like, it's also just not the time where you can have a joke. It can completely ruin an RP moment, even if, you know, most people aren't running a show like you are. It still kind of ruins it for the five, six people audience that you've got. So when you're in the moment running a game as a dungeon master, how do you manage a player or even your entire party who are kind of putting in those peanut gallery remarks? How often do you as a dungeon master need to Manage I literally, I, I look them in the eye and I just do this. I know you can't see me. I just hold up one, one finger like the, you know, give me a second. You know, that, that's it. You know, that no, nine times out of 10, that's enough. They're like, they're like, herp derp, and you just, just give it to them. Just a and they usually get, look. Yeah. And they usually get, they get the message. And then you, you go back to the, I mean, if, if, it, if it's too, if everybody is kind of having a, a, a giggle fit, to tell you the truth, if everyone is having a giggle fit, a lot of times I let it happen. Because at the end of the day, we're here to have a good time. You know what I mean? And if, if they're all in this moment, you know, really just having a ball, I'll let it happen because I know it normally will settle on its own after a moment. Um, if it's not settling fast enough, just be like, okay, hang on. Everybody settle down. Let's, let's, let's go back into this. So you were saying, you know, and then you just direct it back. Sorry, I will just say, if you got somebody who is consistently being a problem, just pull it aside and explain it to them. I've had streams that were like that. Uh, I won't name the stream, because if you if I name the stream, you'll know the person. But there was a lot of that's what she said, and I just had to be like, that. that's not what we're doing here. Like, stop that. You know, <laughs> like, I realize you're, you're just, you're trying to participate, and, you know, you think it's funny, but that's, that's this isn't the time for that. Um, and that person completely got the message and it wasn't a problem afterwards, but I had to be like, yo, don't, don't. <laughs> yeah. It can be really hard for dungeon masters because you know, look, I mean, I can speak from personal experience that it is really hard for some people to do confrontation. We're not very confrontational people. And often when you have someone doing something like that, it, it can be hard. So do you have any advice for people who need to pull someone aside and give them the friendly talking to, but don't want to kick them out of the game? Couch it in the language of you're inhibiting everybody else's experience because they're probably being silly because they want everybody else to have a good time for the most part. I mean, assholes exist, but, you know, they they think they're helping. And when you're like what you're doing is not helping, a lot of times that's enough. You know, a lot of times that's enough. 
And and again, uh, the the nobody ever wants to break up with a player, and it sucks, you know. But but not everybody belongs at every table. Unfortunately, it does come to that sometimes. But usually, it's just a, a matter of being like, hey, I'm I'm trying to craft a very specific experience here. And too many distractions makes that hard. Uh, if if they're acting in good faith, that's usually good enough, you know. But but you know, think back to what I said at the beginning about. Not every table's for every player and not everybody's playing the same game. And you have to make sure you've set that expectation because if they thought it was going to be happy-go-lucky skull kickers, her, 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 and then it isn't, they may be just as disappointed. <laughs> so a lot of that is set in expectations. We get a lot of similar lists when I ask this, but I do see some variation. That's why I always try to ask, what is your session zero checklist? What are the things that you're like, okay, we have to cover these things so that people know what kind of game we're playing here? Because session zero, as we said, it's very, very important. Uh, you know, it's funny. I'm literally doing a session zero for a project tonight. So this is this is about to happen. Um, again, I, I think most important for me is knowing the tone and the vibe. To let people know what the safety tools are, how they can flag me if something's wrong. Uh, you know, in this day and age, with the with everybody being on Zoom, it's pretty easy to message. Uh, you know, yellow card and red card systems are great, except sometimes people are embarrassed in the moment if they're at the table to show, you know, a yellow card and let everybody else know. You know what I mean? And be like, oh, what's wrong with you type thing. Or at least that's what people get in their head. I find very rarely do the other players actually feel that way, but that fear is real. So being like hey um you know text me if it's an issue or something like that like give give them a way that they can notify you subtly um i let them know of uh you know i get everybody's lines and veils i let them know the stuff i'm not going to do which is usually pretty obvious if i'm gonna do something that i think might be tricky for people I try and give a content warning like i never do violence against children for instance that's a problem for me but things like ghost children why well, it happens, you know, like that comes up a lot. So when when, when that happens, I'm, I'm, I'm going to warn people like, hey, look, you know, there's going to be some ghost kids in this. That's if that's heads up, that's your content warning. You know, uh, usually I'll give content warning before I start like yelling and stuff. Like if I because I'll yell and scream and stuff during streams, but I'll tell people it's coming if only to turn their volume down, you know, before it starts happening, because, you know, some people have trouble with that. Um, you know, based, based on their, their own uh, backgrounds and experiences. Um, yeah, no, uh, obviously I'd never do, uh, you know, force sex, non-consensual stuff like that. A lot of times I tend to not do sex, period. I'll flirt a lot because it's it's hard to do well and it's very easy to do poorly. So if it's implied that it's about to go down, I just fade out. You know what I mean? Dot, dot, dot is how I handle it. But, Who knows what you know, I, I, yeah, but, you know, I got some players that are like, I don't want my characters to have sex scenes. Like, I, I don't want those interactions. And I'm like, okay, you won't get them, you know? And I'll say even on the Black Dice Society, I've ranged from having fairly extensive itemized lists of what one person can't stand to another person being like, give me anything, do what you want. I'm more out of that category, by the way. I'm like, do anything. Uh, if, if, if we end up tripping on something, I'll let you know at the time. <laughs> Otherwise, let's go, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, I, I think it's just more the understanding that it is going to be a safe environment, that you are there to take care of them mentally and emotionally, and you want everyone to have a good time. Beyond that, then it becomes just the mechanical stuff. You know, what, what, what level is this? Where, where are we set? Do any of you know each other in advance? I usually try, like, relationship maps have become real big in games recently. Um, I'll use those sometimes, but at least having some tie in advance between at least some of the characters just helps you move along faster from the man in black in the tavern scene you know uh because people can kind of like float idly if you're not careful with that and i do so many one shots i started as late as possible in the story and, and you never go wrong with you've all been summoned by the same mysterious benefactor there you go now you got a common thread because that that's one of the hardest things about D D in particular that so many games are like you have people that would never hang out, you know, that you got the lawful good, you know, vengeance paladin and the chaotic neutral mass murdering rogue. Like they would not be friends unless you got some reason that they have to be because that's how most D&D &D games start. Like, hey, we all met in the tavern. You want to go 
camping together for six months and become gods. Yeah, you know, so. <laughs> We, we obviously have a lot of different types of horror in the newest Ravenloft book. You've got Lovecraftian hmm? cosmic horror, you've got body horror, you've got all types of different horror that you can cover in your D&D games. What are some things that you see as big mistakes with all these different types of horror? You can go specific, you can go general, but I mean, horror is hard to do. It's hard to pull off a lot of the times. Professional hmm. writers have trouble, let alone dungeon masters. So what are some mistakes that you've seen and how do you fix them? going too far without consent you know and i've had i've had players i've had players you know and, and i try to look at it as you're just being invested but it's stuff like you know you can't kill my animal companion i'm like mm, i can and they're like you can't and i'm like ah but i can you know like at some point a fireball is gonna go off and if your horse is there your horse might get smoked you know um, you know, and have people that that was just like a super, super, super no go for, and we kind of had to work it out. There were there was times usually, I'll just let the horse live because I'm like clearly this means something to you. Fine. Sometimes people get weird about things like uh, charm spells and dominate anything that robs them of their free will. But being robbed of your free will is a well worn element of horror especially things like Lovecraftian horror, not being able to trust your own senses, not being able to trust your own actions. Um, and, uh, you know, some of that is, is you kind of got to read the table and you got to read where people are and, and don't be afraid to check in in the middle of something. If something heavy is happening, being like, everybody good? We're, we're all, okay, great. And then, you know, back in. Stuff like that. Because, I mean, for the most part, if they know they've shown up for a horror game, to a certain extent, all bets are off. But I see people get, sometimes they get really weird about that, where they, you know, don't want their character to die or don't want some uh, NPC to die or something like that. And sometimes I'm like, that's literally the game and that's the story and it's got to go where it goes. More often than not, I will usually ease off on that. Because I, I had a situation where I had a character who was capable of taking people's souls and we were on a rescue mission where I'm, I'm trying to be vague again because i actually hopefully you won't know exactly what i'm talking about we were on a rescue mission where we were going to rescue another characters a family member of another player character who someone else was trying to steal their power and use it for evil and i was very clear that i was like if we can't rescue them i'm going to kill them there like, one way or another, they're not going to fall into the bad guy's hands. Like, we're all going home, or, you know, one one way or another, the demon's not getting his power. And this person was like, well, you can't. And again, I'm like, I can. And they're like, no, you can't. And I'm like, no, I think I really can. And they got very, very emotional that it's like, you can't kill this character's family member. And they were like, the human was upset about it. And I was like, I mean, that's a choice. Okay. And ultimately, I didn't do it. Although ultimately the relative did die, but I didn't kill him. Go. Well, sorry, I, I mean to interrupt, but I mean to give you the the counterpoint in a story like Vampire, you know, my character Victor Temple has children. The children have been introduced into the narrative. It's Schrodinger's. It's uh, not Schrodinger's. Uh, Chekhov's gun. Uh, once a point of vulnerability has been revealed, then that is a point of vulnerability that, of course, can be exploited. Of course, it can. You know, you try to stop it. You hope it doesn't. But that's the point. You know, you can't be overly precious about that. Inevitably, I mean, we're going to stray away from horror again for a second. But I think that this is very important. PvP, not like mechanically, but IRL disagreements between players. I mean, they can really become a rift in a D&D &D game. Even in-game arguments like whether or not to kill that family member, they can get pretty heated sometimes. I mean, how do you manage or diffuse those kind of situations? I mean, bleed exists for a lot of people. Uh, it's, it's not really a problem that I've got because I very much can... I put that mask on and I take that mask off, you know, and I'm, where I'm like, we're now playing this game and now we're not playing this game. I definitely have had moments at the table that actual human emotions were accessed for definitely. But, you know, for the most part, 
this is a collaborative storytelling art that this is a this is a story we're telling together and a journey that we're telling together and that doesn't mean that things are always going to go your way because that's also how life works in terms of you know situations like that you know again in my my own personal experience if i had not been one of the players but if i'd been the one running the thing you know again i i, I always try i try to come down on who is this going to do the most emotional harm to if it goes a certain way? You know, will will this person be truly heartbroken and this person will just be a little, you know, a little irritated and disappointed? Unfortunately, there's also times where, you know, there's the squeaky wheel person who's going to be mad no matter what. And then it kind of becomes easier to care less and less about, you know, the <laughs> how that person thinks it should go because it's like you're just going, you you have committed to irritation, you know? And as such now, we got to tell the story that the rest of us are telling because you're going to be mad no matter what. But yeah, it's just try and, and look and see also what's the undercurrent of what's going on here. Like, for instance, the person that is just adamant that the horse can't die, maybe their dog really did die recently. You know what I mean? Like that, that that's important context to, to, to try and be mindful of, you know, things like that. Uh, and adjust. But I mean, again, at the end of the day, the game is supposed to be fun. And even when it, you're telling scary stories, it's still supposed to be enjoyable and cathartic. And everything should be calibrated towards that. Awesome. So one last piece of advice for DMs who are just picking up Curse of Strahd. They've just picked up the Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, and they are ready to scare the crap out of their players. Is there something that you haven't covered yet that you're like, they should probably know this because it's really important? I mean, first and foremost, do it. But ways to introduce tension and Van Richten's Guide X has a really great section on it that explains this to you. But especially if you're playing with a lot of existing characters, don't say a cave troll because they're to the best of their ability. They're going to try not to be meta, but they are. They're going to know, oh, regeneration and acid and fire and all this stuff versus you see a hulking, green-skinned, multi-headed horror that is clawing its way towards you. Mess with things like sounds. Do, like, practical stuff. Like, run your fingers across the table and let them hear it. You know, bang on the table. Stuff like that. Actually get real sensations um, in the game. Um, remember that one of the key things about horror is what you don't see. We take things like the first Alien movie, which is not everybody realizes this is a straight up horror movie. The xenomorph is on screen. The xenomorph is on screen for eight minutes because when you what you don't see is always scarier than what you do see. And also, if you try and get too intricate in your descriptions, and this is true about any time you're trying to create an emotional response. When I say, you know, a hulking green skinned monstrosity covered in boils in pus everybody sees something different and the moment that i reveal a picture and it crystallizes it is inherently going to be less frightening because your mind will fill in the scariest thing and also then this works when you're trying to do happy things like if you're like she's the most beautiful woman you've ever seen that means something different to everyone the moment I'm like, she's a 5'10 athletic redhead, that may or may not be your jam. You know, you're like, well, that's not the most beautiful woman I ever seen, <laughs> you know? Um, so a lot of times less is more. With all of this, less is more. So it, I think that's another common mistake new DMs make. They think they have to just prepare and prepare and prepare and have hours of contingencies, but no plan survives contact with the enemy. Half the things you plan, they are not going to do. And not only that, you run the risk of then trying to railroad and force them to do the thing you planned, which if you have this keep that you've mapped out every floor and you know all of the denizens of, but the cast decides they want to fire, follow the goblin out into the into the woods and see where it lives and, you know, name name it Scrambles, you kind of got to let them, you know, because the more you try and take that from them, the more unfulfilling of an experience they're going to have. Awesome. That was some that was some great advice. So thank you so much for coming on the show. We have one last thing to do, Mr. B. Dave Walters. What have you got going on this week? You're hearing this next week, so I guess D&D Celebration is already done. Uh, we did a game called The Dungeon and the Dragon Sunday at 1. Uh, if you didn't see it, go watch the VOD. It is something really special. It is um, 
Todd Stashwick, Alicia Marie, Matthew Lillard, Deborah Ann Wall, and Patrick Rothfuss, and they are playing monsters on a revenge heist mission. And it is really something special. Check that out. Um, I guess in uh, there's still Heroes of the Plains is Tuesdays, Black Dice Societies, Thursdays at four on DD Twitch and YouTube, LA by Night still gonna be going on by then, uh, in our, our our final season of this chronicle. And uh, yeah, follow me on the tweetograms at B Dave Walters. And by the way, my DMs are open. If you have um, any questions about this, you know, storytelling conundrums, you're not sure how to solve or any or need advice about, you know, hit me on Twitter or, or DM me. Of course. So if you guys enjoyed this episode of Roll for Insight, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then please do subscribe to Crispy's Tavern or follow us on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. If you want to leave your own thoughts, questions, stories, whatever, go down to the comments down below if you're able. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment Black Dice Society to let me know you made it to the end of the video. In essence, like, comment, subscribe. We will both see you all next time. Farewell. Farewell.